Hi, everyone, and welcome to our fourth and last episode of Music Industry Talks second edition. We've been having these webinars every Sunday in February. Uh, as you tune in, let us know where you're from in the comments below. And don't forget to like and share this video so that more people can see it. And if it's your first time watching our webinars or hearing about Syncopated Noise Foundation, we are a nonprofit organization that promotes Canadian emerging musicians through events and educational activities. And the focus of Music Industry Talks second edition is to spotlight Canadian artists and music industry professionals of underserved communities to share their stories and to help the industry stay connected during this global pandemic. I would like to take a moment to thank Factor Canada for making this series possible. And I'd like to also give a shout out to our amazing remote team that has been working behind the scenes to make this project possible. Uh, Francesca Sacerdoti, Sandro Ferraro, Robert Fliss, Nicolas Saikali, and Stephanie Richard. I will now leave you in the hands of our host for the day, Pamela Dennis, who's back for this last episode. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you, Alessia and Syncopated Noise Foundation for having me as a, guest, as a guest host. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Pamela Dennis. I've had the chance to work with many artists and vocalists um, and touring the world. I'm lucky to have been able to organize events and music business networking events, which allowed me to support and connect with industry professionals and artists from uh, various communities. So I'm currently a freelance music marketing and business development consultant. And today I am here with our special guest, Modibo Keita. I'm born in Montreal, Canada. Modiba Keita is a music entrepreneur. Through his work as a professional trombonist, he has worked with various artists like Narcy, Voxambu, Dr. Natsivo, and Kobo Town, amongst others, and has toured all over the world. Keita is also the founder an artistic director of Montreal-based concert series, The Shed Montreal, and We Up, Re Up, bringing talent from the underground hip hop and R&B scene to the stage. The concert series has been one of the fastest growing in Montreal in the last three years. The Shed Montreal is officially endorsed by Red Bull Music Canada. More recently, Keita has unveiled his clothing line of Afrocentric outerwear called Famaden, set to be released in 2021. Muriba Keita is a Twig Music and Yamaha Music Canada clinician. Um, thank you for joining us and uh, welcome. Hi, how you doing? Great, thanks. Um, you've been doing so many interesting things in the last three years and I'm really excited to kind of like dig into all these deal projects that you're doing. Um, but foremost, you are a musician. You started as a musician. So um, can you tell us, um, can you take us through the, the early developments uh, as a musician? Where did you begin to refine your craft and develop your musical ability? Yeah, um, basically for me, it was, it was the, the typical story, you know, like I started playing music in, in high school. I don't really come from a musical family by any means. Um, it was more, I always had like an interest for, for music. So uh, I was really into music, despite the fact that I wasn't playing yet. So um, when I got to high school, um, I had music classes. So through there, I started playing classical music. And, you know, I, because I was already a hip hop head, I was already a jazz head. Uh, I was into all that stuff. Um, I kind of was trying to find a way to play these kind of music. So, so um, I started, going out and and checking out these uh, community community collective since i was like 12 these guys gave me the opportunity to to play with them so i kind of grew through them um as as well as nomadic massive they kind of they kind of fostered me from a very young age into uh when i officially went to study music um when i went to high, like upper studies um, but that was kind of my training ground, you know, like improvised music and, uh, and hip hop music. I, I learned my, I got my musical identity together through that practice. Nice. Um, who inspired you? Um, cause you did, you picked an instrument that is, I'm going to say not mainstream, but in any way it's that 
it's pejorative. Um, so I'm curious to know who your inspirations, like what attracted you to that specific instrument? So as like musically, I have some inspirations, but I also have, I think in terms of how I see myself as a musician, another inspiration. So like in terms of musically speaking, I think, um, that story is pretty funny because I, I'm, I'm, I wanted to be a trumpet player. That's like the trumpet is, is like the instrument that really draw, like drew me towards music, especially when we're talking about like executing music, not necessarily listening to like, but like I was like, I'm not, I don't feel like I would have been out there trying to listen to trumpet when I was like 11, 12, but that definitely was the instrument that was interesting me the most. So when I was in, uh, in music class, my teacher um, told me when we were trying out the instruments, yeah, maybe you should try the trombone because uh, your lips are a little big. So I don't know if it's gonna work so easily for you on the trumpet. So me being like, yeah, whatever, you know better than me. So I took, I took the trombone, but really it was just because nobody really wanted to play the trombone. So I kind of found a way to like get me to, and it was cool, you know, cause I, I, I was into the music. So it wasn't like, like I didn't, I didn't mind not playing the trumpet at, at that point. So, um, but I wasn't as into the trumpet as I was into, like I wasn't as in, uh, into the trombone as much as I was into the trumpet. So it kind of took me a while to kind of get into it. You know what I mean? So for me, it's really, it's really about like um, thinking about that part of it that was big. But then after, um, you know, I, I just, found a love for it and I it just it just worked out so but in terms of like being a, a musician like how I see myself being a musician I think for me my biggest inspiration and I'll always say this is Vox Sambu who's a musician from Montreal um he took me when I was like 11 years old I was like in a really tough neighborhood you know and I and he saw that I was playing music he took me to all these places and he kind of like put me in rooms and around people that gave me the tools to become the person I am today. So like, I think that's just the bottom line, you know, and up till this day, I still look up to him, you know? That's amazing. So you had, you had a mentor. I think not a lot of people can say that they have their inspiration is in Montreal and they have a mentor that, you know, takes them under their wings and, and develops uh, their musical ability. I mean, um, that's that's something to be proud of yeah i think it's it's funny because all throughout my development it was always like i always had mentors whether it was you know like of course vox was like one of my first big ones you know um but like as i as i started studying music and stuff like i went to jazz school so like a lot of the guys that you know for example that i work with in we up re up are some of my old mentors when I did the Betty Carter Jazz Ahead, for example. So and some of these cats are like playing with like some of the biggest names in the world. So so it was really cool to get the coaching from these people on the music and things. But like because I've I've been used to grow like that in the musical environment, for me in the more entrepreneurial side of things, I kind of took the same approach. So I have some people in the music, well not in the music scene, but just in, in the business side of things that are also like, to me, some mentors. Like I would say that about like the guys from Moonshine, right. the, the collective that runs Moonshine, they've been really, really key in guiding me in terms like how I should run my things and how like, like things that I should look out for business wise, yeah. you know? So I've been, I've been lucky to be just at the right place at the right moment around the right people, you know? Well, it's, you're lucky, but at the same time, you're doing the work to be at the same time, you know, to be at the, at the right moment, you know. Um, I'm, and you've, you've toured with so many musicians, and just to give people kind of like a, a, a picture, so all these, art, all these artists that you're mentioning, these collectives, community, you were mentioning Jazz Ahead, Vox Sambu, they all operate in the, what, not all, but in the jazz field, world, music, um, hip hop. So we're really focusing on all your mentors and how you've grown has been mostly in those uh, genres. Yeah, I would say so. I think, um, you know, obviously like through like jazz education, you got to do 
you got to do like the classical thing for a bit, you know, that's, I think that's an easy, like the classical thing is, is kind of an easy way to build your technique uh, because the jazz thing can get pretty deep sometimes. I'm not, not trying to shoot down the classical music, but I think there's kind of like, uh, there's definitely like a process that's institutionally built to learn through classical music and jazz music is not really taught like that. Yeah. Jazz music is really like, we're going to toss you in the fire and you better stay alive. That's like <laughs> the approach. Like a lot of my mentors had that approach, you know, like yeah. they, I, I, I have stories for, I could write a book about all the crazy stories I had with my jazz mentors, you know, because the approach is really different because culturally that's not how you teach jazz. You don't te yeah. teach jazz by, by being like, okay, so we're going to try this piece. That's really easy. Like we give you the stuff right away. And then, you got to figure out a way to make it work, you know? Yeah. Actually, about, about these stories that you're saying, I mean, you've toured with, with so many artists around the world. It must have been a thrill. I, I know it's exciting. You're in a different country, different culture, different food, different people. Um, I'm certain you have some exciting sh stories to share. Can you share one of us, <laughs> one, of, one of them? Yeah, I mean, it's funny because I've been touring since I was like, 17 or even I guess my first my first tour outside of the country was when I was 17 and I turned 18 in New York City and I was playing at a club called the Pyramid and I wasn't of age yet but I was playing and they celebrated my birthday there but then they, like it was with Nomadic Massive and then like they were obviously because it was my birthday they were all like going crazy ah it's his birthday da, da, da. but then they realized that they can't really talk about that because I'm 18 not 21 and I was in the club so they might you know what I mean so it was like oh yeah never mind we just play with him like it's, <laughs> you know like so you know there was there's so many things man like um it's it's like I said, like I'm saying, it's tough because I've been on the road for such a minute that like, and with different bands too. So it's a different experience. Like some bands, like I'm really tight with the, with the guys because some of them are my, my friends from a long time, but then with some other bands is more like I met them through the label that I work with. So I just like, for example, with Dr. Nativo, um, just before the pandemic, that's basically like the, the last big gig I did before the pandemic, um, Dr. Nutivo and his band live in Miami, but I'm the only band member that lives in Montreal. So whenever we do gigs, I fly out to wherever they are and I meet them there. Uh, same thing with Cobo Town. Cobo Town lives mostly in Ottawa and Toronto, but I'm the only one that lives in Montreal. So same thing, whenever there's something, I fly out and meet them wherever I need to meet them. So it's kind of a different dynamic than working with a band that you live in the, si in the same city as, you know? Um, like with Vox, for example, is not the same dynamic because his old band is based here. Or Nomadic, when I used to play with them, it was the same thing, they're, they're based here. So I think a lot of things change. Like there's not as much rehearsing, there's longer rehearsing <laughs> and uh, you know, so, so yeah. It just sounds so exciting to be able to, to, to be kind of like a global citizen, like the Montreal is not a barrier to, you know, who we can work with and play with, you know, so that's really cool. Um, you founded The Shed, which is a really yeah. stellar underground event, and you know I've, I've been there uh, to your events, um, and you showcase the talent of local and international artists. Um, and I'm curious to know, I think that was kind of like the first of your initiatives that you started that I know of. Um, what inspired you to start this event series? Well, it's that, that's, that event kind of started as an accident. It's weird to say it like that, but it basically what happened was um, bass player Rich Brown was in town and Rich is like internationally known, like he's like, a really, really, really like respected bass player around the world. He yeah. lives in Toronto and I, I, went, I went to school in Toronto. So I kind of knew of Rich, but he came to the city and I was like, man, like he's just coming for this one show. That's not even about him. Can Like I'm trying to do something so that we can kind of showcase him and kind of find an occasion to just hear him play. Cause yeah. that guy is crazy, you know? Yeah. So 
I was like thinking, I was like, what can I do? Like, can I find a way to kind of make like a show, but like kind of make money while doing the show? And then like all the, the elements of the night for the, for the people that don't know, like basically the shed is to make a long story short, it's just uh, like a concert that happens in a pop-up venue. So it's a concert that happens in a venue that I transform. That's not like, it could be like anything. It could be like a, a art gallery. It could be, uh, you know, a loft. It could be like a residence. It could be anything, but we transform it for that night into uh, a venue. So we have a bar, we have, uh, we have all types of things. Like basically what a venue has, but in, in the space. And basically I was like, some of my friends were like, well, you can do it in our, in our loft. Like, they had a loft on Saint Laurent, um, around like Prince Arthur and Saint Laurent. And they were like, yo, we, we, we do shows all the time here. Like, why don't you just do it here? So I'm like, okay, cool. That's a cool idea. Well, wait, so this whole thing, I want to be able to pay him. Like, I don't want, I don't want him to just show up. And so then it, it was like, okay, well, how are we going to make money to pay him? And then we found, we like got the proper, um, we started selling tickets and then we got the proper like permits to, to be able to do alcohol as well. And we did all this, it ended up being an event, you know what I'm saying? But it was, it meant to, it was meant to be a one-off, you know? And it worked out so nice that all the guys were like, yo, you, you know, you got to do this again. It's like, okay, well, okay. The Jazz Fest coming up, let me do one during the Jazz Fest. So we did another one. And then that worked even better. There was a lot of like things that were a little off again, because the goal wasn't to go full on with that. Um, but it's ended up being cool, you know? But when it really became like a thing thing, after that event, we, um, we started our relationship with Red Bull, um, first of all. And then we got our, our third event. The third event is really when things kind of settled down. And it was like, okay, now, we're, now this is a thing. Because we got our first burst of like um, burst of like clientele and fan base, and we created a pretty solid fan base. And and you know, the, after that, the rest was history. We just kept on doing the thing and trying to make it grow and build it into something. I've been really fortunate to be able to book some some seriously great artists and be in touch with some seri seriously great artists, like internationally known. You know to be able to come to the shed. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, um, right. all these bookings are still on hold, you know, um, but our, our lineup for 2020, 2021 was going to be pretty insane, you know? And I, the reason why I say that is because usually these type of people that I was booking were only reserved to the big players in the promotion area. I'm self-funded. I don't have no grants that, is holding me so like in other words we're actually profitable that's the big that's the big thing about the shed that's that makes it special and that's why i put so much effort in it is that it's something that is actually profitable because of the way i structured it and and it just keeps on growing and it keeps on growing not only for our pockets but for the people that are so part partake into the event you know like I've been really, really, really happy to be able to pay people that are, for example, shooting the video, that are doing sound, that are doing um, like the music, more money every time we do an event. To me, that's like one of the biggest things that we should strive for as like a, an institution. And I've been able to do that. So, yeah. That's super exciting. Once again, congratulations on, you know, giving this to the community, giving this to the Montreal music community and I can't wait for the next one honestly well there's a lot of things I I can't wait until you know this pandemic <laughs> goes to bed um but you know you were talking earlier about getting in contact and, and booking all these amazing musicians um having a a network and being able to establish a connection with these artists is important so how do you how do you reach out to these musicians and artists um okay so for me okay so the big thing about that that's actually a, okay so a lot of a lot of the times people ask me that question because i end up being in touch with especially with like for example we up re up i have some some pretty big names in there and it's kind of i always tell people that it's a 
it's kind of a long-term thing. You can't think of like your target as like, like when you, when I'm saying target, like when you're trying to book somebody, you always have a target and you have a second plan and you have a third plan. So your target is always over a certain amount of hour, uh, uh, amount of uh, years. Okay. So I'll give you an example and I'm giving you, I'm going to give you like a very, very, very extreme example just so that you understand. Right. So if your target is like Beyonce, okay. You're not going to show up to beyond, even if you had the money. Okay. Even if you had the money and if you had all the resources necessary, if you show up to Beyonce's management and you ask them to book her, they'd probably say no. And the reason is simple is because they have no relationship and they have no background check on you. Of course. You know what I mean? They need to be 100% sure that you're not skeezy, that you do the right kind of business, that you do their kind of business. And then, then we can talk about like how we're going to do business. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I think in my case, what happened is that I kind of did that without realizing that I was doing that because all these people I was playing with, so we, they already knew me. They already knew me from like playing or being in the same room as them or whatever. And then we built a relationship like that. And basically I started off the shed with my relationships and then I built up to the relationships I have now. You know what I mean? That's why I call it like a long-term game because I think a lot, I see that mistake done a lot, um, whether it's for like recording or it's for uh, booking people will go to the people directly because they see like a, an email for booking or they see something people will be like, okay, well I can just hit them up. It's like, nah, cause you want all the chances on your side. You know what I mean? So what can you do to have the chances on your side? And that's how I was, I was thinking. I was thinking about like checkmating the, <laughs> the people and be like, there's no way. Yeah, and it's just no way you can you can say no. I think like when you book, you need to have a booking strategy the same way when you sell a product, you want to have a, like a marketing strategy yeah. is the same thing. It's not because it's not because you just go and offer money to people that they're going to say yes, I think. I mean, I you know I'm like that. <laughs> that makes complete sense. You know, like you used your your network, your resources that you had and from your you know, experiences from the, from the different like bands and artists that you worked with and you leverage that in, under, in order to reach um, the names that you wanted to reach. And I think that's a, it's a very sound strategy actually. And since you mentioned We Up, Re Up, can you tell us about that, that second project? <laughs> yeah, um, We Up, Re Up basically is just, um, okay, so the way it started, We Up, Re Up um, is, I was, you know, it was the pandemic, it was the middle of the pandemic. And then I get a message from one of my old teachers from Betty Carter's Jazz Ahead. And Betty Carter's Jazz Ahead basically is a program that runs at the Kennedy Center for, I think, uh, kids between the age of like, I think 16 to 25. And they pick 25 in the world. And then you go and then you perform your, your stuff um, sure. you perform your stuff and then you, you like, you, you bring in compositions and you play with these kids, whatever. And you have master classes by like some of the greatest jazz musicians. You know? nice. So, but one of the guys in there reached out to me, was like, Hey man, I seen what you've been doing with the shed. You think you could do that with us? <laughs> so I was like, yeah, I mean, I did, I did it already. I know no already. Way. Yeah. He was like, I have, um, like, I have a plan with this and, and I know it worked on my side. I probably could do it again and keep in mind like that's one of my mentors like that's I, like I respect JD Allen he's a great saxophonist from Detroit um and uh, you know he's played with everybody Betty Carter Ornette Coleman uh, Butch Morris like name it you know it's like yeah. big big leagues you know and then I'm just he's like I'm like yeah I can do this like but it's not complicated we just have to have time and we have to be pretty disciplined about how we're going to approach this so uh, we started We Up, We Up as a way to raise funds for our project because right now we can't do anything because we're, we're in the middle of a pandemic. So um, basically we started We Up, We Up as a way to kind of showcase what we can offer. And while we do that, we're raising funds to be able to put up our own shows and our own, own productions. So how we do that is that we have a platform on Patreon and then we pre-record concerts 
um, that are showed every week. There's a different concert. Um, last week, we had a documentary of this great pianist uh, based in Chicago called Alexis Mombre. She um, basically documented the process of creating our album. And she premiered the documentary on We Up, Re Up. So we just put a bunch of content. We had a call the other day talking about like music theory and all that stuff. We kind of want it to be like a resource for musicians and non-musicians, people that have an interest in music or people that just want to learn more, you know? And that's kind of what we've been doing. It's been great. There's been, there's some really serious musicians involved in there. And arguably there's no platform that is like geared in a way that makes the access to these people so easy. Right. You know, like sometimes usually like, let's say if you wanted to like talk to some of these guys, you'd have to be accepted in a university that they teach at. That's really, you know what I mean? But then it's just like, if you're among the group, then you could just get on the, the Zoom call yeah. and, you know, discuss, you know, so. You're accessible. Yeah, I think that's, that's the, the key. That's really the key. Amazing. Um, you seem like an accomplished artist. You're dedicated to the art, to the promotion of um, music and artists, musicians. How, so, and I also feel that it's almost like a, um, activism feel to what you do, um, where you want to promote Black music and, and, and artists? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, being, uh, being myself Black, I, um, I think it's like, not, it's, it doesn't even have to do about like, it doesn't even have to do about like, how I identify. It's more like, this is really what the roots of the music that I'm doing is, you know what I mean? Like Absolutely. it's, it, it almost goes beyond like who I am, you know, like it's more about like, if I'm playing hip hop music, then I better be representing the black people because that's where it comes from. If I'm playing jazz music, this doesn't come from Ireland. It it's comes from, you know what I mean? Like it's just being realistic. You know what I mean? If we're talking about like cooking lasagna, I'm not going to talk to you with a, Southern American tip. I'm going to talk to you about it with an Italian tip. We're talk, talking making sushi. It's the same thing, you know. It's just about say, staying in, like, true to the tradition. This is what the tradition is. So I'm not gonna like. For me, it's important so that that these people talk about the tradition and we get these people's narrative of the tradition. I think that's really important. That's why all this is like that's the motivation behind what I do. I completely agree and I support you 100%. Um, right. All right, so we talked about The Shed. Um, we talked about We Are We Up. And then there's another thing coming up. Um, you just launched your clothing line, Famaden. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't take you for a like designer or anything of the sort, but I guess that's a passion that you have as well. Yeah, I think um, for me, for me, like the way I perceive Famaden is like, um, it's another way of expressing myself. So like, for example, like, you know, I'm a musician, that's one dimension. Then the second dimension is curating an environment, which is the shed. I create an environment punctually through a space that is my vision of what music and going to a music event is like. Then I wanted to create what somebody that lives my lifestyle or that is me, and ident identifies as me, would dress like in a world where he could do whatever he wants, you know? And that's where the idea of Famadeen comes from. You know, like the, the reality is I'm, I'm Canadian because I was born here, um, but I'm from Mali in my origins, but you know, I, like I was raised around Haitians and I was, you know, I went to school in Toronto, was, brought up in the music industry by black Americans, learn Italian in school, you know, like, so my, my baggage is very mixed, you know, just in general. Yeah. So Famande, I wanted to kind of express that through the clothing. So this is why it's outdoors clothing. It's only like coats and it's only uh, capes, winter capes and spring capes and spring coats and winter coats um, that are built out of African fabric. 
and I import the African fabric from Mali because my business, uh, my family has uh, a business down there and we import all the stuff here. I worked with a designer um, here and we worked over the, the concept of the brand for a full year. So I started working on Fama Day like for real, for real in 2008, end of 2018, beginning of 2019. The project was pilot for at least two years before that. So it was really three years in the making. Okay. And like, I got the first piece like a couple months ago um, and now we're just sorting out the production and we should be able to put it on the market very soon. Dope. I'm wishing you success. I'm so excited to see like how everything is going to come together and like when COVID like dies off, of course. Um, anything else you're secretly planning? <laughs> Any other secret projects? No, right now, I think I, I, for me, it's just about focusing on, on these uh, on these three, you know, on these three and, and just really um, finding a way to to just really make these three things grow for now, um, especially being in, in COVID, you know. Um, Mudibo, that was an amazing interview. Thank you so much for sharing everything that you've been doing. Um, obviously COVID, you, you're, you're doing the best of, of COVID right now and I support you, I'm very happy for you. So this is a close of our interview. And so thank you everyone who's been watching and following our music industry talk series every Sunday this month. If you enjoyed our event today, hit like, comment, and share this video so that it can reach more people. Thanks to Motibu Keita for sharing his story with us today. Thanks to Factor Canada, all of our previous guest speakers, Mark Ash, Bela, Logan Stats, and all of you from home for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the Foundation's mailing list at syncopatednoise.org. Follow the Foundation on its social media platforms at Syncopated Noise on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Stay tuned for more projects and initiatives that help support Canadian emerging musicians. And if you'd like to make a donation to the Foundation, the link will be available below. Thanks everybody for watching and stay safe.